Essentially what I do is I, I do data management. Data to me is what's really fun in life. I don't get to do a lot of the geostatistical analysis or that kind of stuff. I put together these big data sets for people so they can then do that kind of work. So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to start by kind of describing what the Dominion Land Survey System grid is so you have an idea of kind of how it fits into some of the other stuff you may have seen, some of the problems and, and why we don't like roads, how we used FME to get rid of roads, uh, and then how we dealt with testing the whole process and working with the whole process. So of course, the big impetus behind this is that we all know that in 2015, we don't need any roads anymore because you know we'll all be flying everywhere. If you've seen Back to the Future, you should absolutely recognize this, but you know. So what is the Western Canadian Dominion Land Survey System? So essentially, it covers about 1.5 million square kilometers. So that's kind of the size of 10 Englands. So to put that into perspective, it's a big area. Uh, one of the problems that we constantly have is that we're dealing with these massive data sets across very large regional areas. That kills spatial indexing. That kills uh, FME for memory management, that kind of stuff. So we're dealing with about 10 million polygons. So it's not a small little world. I go to a lot of talks about municipalities dealing with the same kind of stuff we're talking about. And it's often in a much smaller regional area. Um, we have problems with projections. We have problems with all that kind of stuff. The, uh, the FME keynote presentations have made me cringe a few times now where all of a sudden Northern Canada is absolutely massive and it just kind of, yeah, makes me cringe a little bit. So what we're looking at is across that whole grid that you saw, we're looking at a whole lot of boxes. Uh, that's what it is. It's just a regular grid where everything's divided. It's generally really, really nice divisions, as you can see here. I've actually picked an area that's, that's fairly clean. Uh, so you can get an idea that it's just these nice square grids, right? Uh, I zoomed in a little bit so you can see where we start running into problems. So I'm going to use the laser pointer here. You can see here, all of a sudden, there's a gap in the grid. And here, and all along here. So this is really weird because typically when we're dealing with grid systems, we don't have null space. Everything is covered, right? So if I have a dot, uh, let's say I drill a well right there, where is it? Is it in the polygon to the left or the polygon to the right? If I do a spatial intersect, nothing shows up. So that is a road allowance. So they put these there. They're, they're 20 meter or 30 meter, usually, sections. And this is way back from the 1880s. Uh, and they did this so that the government wouldn't sell the land where they might build a road. Now, in some cases, they built a road. And in some places, they didn't build a road. So that actually sounds like a brilliant idea, right? So if I'm going out and I'm making a new grid, I'm going to put in space for the future. However, the future went underground. So here's a picture of a well. So wells have now gone horizontal and they go under the roads. So what'll happen is this well will be producing from about here all the way to here. And the government wants its money. And for the government to get, yeah, exactly, we all know the government wants its money, right? For the government to get its money, it needs to know which part of that fluid, so let's say it's producing oil, what part of that oil is coming from the polygon on the left, and what part of the oil is coming from the polygon on the right. Because depending where you are, the tax structure can be different. Uh, it may not even be owned by the government. It might be owned by the landowner, at which point the government gets no money for it. So now the government really cares. So who owns that percentage in the red circle? So we have to eliminate roads. This seems like a fairly easy thing, right? So essentially, those are the vertices of the, of the polygon. And all we need to do is we need to expand the southernmost vertices down so that they match the north vertices of the next polygon. And we need to expand the east vertices to the west. Sounds easy. All you would do is snap the vertices south, the nice little south arrows, and snap the vertices west. You instantly start getting some little weird things like this. Really, these aren't big problems. But there are some annoying things. When they numbered this, they weren't thinking about computers. So they snaked it. You can see the same kind of thing throughout other grid systems. In the US, they used a public land survey system. It does exactly the same kind of snaking concept. So the numbering goes this way. And I'm really glad I'm not doing this upstairs where you can't read anything on the screen because it would have been disastrous. So the problem is if you're going from the north to the south, you can't just do a simple mathematical, uh, a simple mathematical calculation to figure out what the number should be because of how things snake, right? 
Also, if this gets cut off in the middle, the number to the left might be 34 to 33, or it might be 34 to 36. I don't know what's going on with the numbers, right? So that causes some problems. We also have correction lines. So of course, latitudes and longitudes, I guess only latitudes, slowly come together at the poles. So they had to correct for this as they were surveying. They corrected for this by just moving over. That's a real problem when you're trying to do GIS work like this, because all of a sudden, the vertices don't match anymore. So what do I snap that top polygon to? I don't have a vertice, I don't have a vertice below it. So if I snap it, I end up getting really weird direction, really weird deviated lines and, and all kinds of things that don't line up. Diagonals are not a happy thing in this world. I also have meridian lines. So all of a sudden I have a 200 meter gap. So what do we do with this kind of stuff? So we put together a workspace for this, and that's the workspace. So in Calgary, I showed this workspace right after the Tales from the Script presentation, and I actually got a great big, oh, from the audience. It was really nice. But I blame the grid. So this here is 36 transformers, creating my west of numbers. And this here is another 36 transformers, creating my south of. So one of the cool things you can do in FME 2014 is you can actually create an attribute on an output port. So you could literally shrink this whole thing to one big test filter with 36 cases. So if we take a look at what we're doing here, we have two major pieces. That's the pink bookmarks. And those are essentially my anchored snapper setups. So this is where I'm setting the west and the south of numbers, right? Um, it looks gross, but it's really simple. It's just creating an attribute. And then the thing that does all the work is the anchored snapper. So the anchored snapper simply takes two sets of features one of them doesn't move, and the other one is allowed to move. So I use a group by, now that I've set all my numbers for the south and the west, and everything works beautifully for me. For the correction lines, things got a little messier. So for the correction lines, we had to use a densifier. So what we did was we took the top lines, and we drastically increased the number of vertices across that. So you're dealing with a million polygons already. Each one of those polygons has about 16 vertices, and now you're densifying. And you're densifying to try to go from a diagonal line to a straight line. So we were looking at a, a, vert, a vertex every centimeter. Well, all of a sudden, across 1.5 million square kilometers, we killed FME. It just couldn't handle it. So we spent a lot of time dealing with very small areas, changing the densifier, and seeing how the lines changed, increasing it, increasing it, and just playing with it until we reached that perfect point between FME's performance and lines that we considered reasonable. Once again, we still had to put in all the, uh, all the attribute creators so that we could do that snapping after we densified, uh, but it was actually pretty simple. The nice thing is, although it looks nasty, because the anchored snapper takes two feature sets, you're essentially copying your entire feature set, the features that went out the end really don't change that much. So they come down and then they skip, so they go through this whole thing, but they don't do anything, and they literally avoid the entire next two bookmarks. So the features themselves actually have very little happening to them. And that's good because it makes things stay clean, right? So we did this. Everything was fine. We ran into a couple minor problems. There were some areas that are theoretical grids, so they don't actually exist. They don't have road allowances, that kind of stuff. And we said, OK, well, we'll just hire a whole bunch of summer students to fill in the places that FME doesn't handle nicely, and all will be easy. So we had six summer students for, I think, about four weeks going in ArcMap and literally drawing in boxes anywhere that FME didn't do it. The problem is you can't trust summer students. So we had to make sure that what they had done was good. So how do we validate their work? Well, we use FME, of course, right? This makes real sense, right? If we're trying to make it so that there's no null spaces in the grid, we can use FME to do that. So now I have my workspace that's 10 transformers or less, which makes me really happy. So I aggregate the entire thing together. I dissolve it, I do a donut extractor because I know there's some large lakes and stuff that aren't surveyed, and then I just simply go, okay, what's left over? There should be absolutely no holes left over. Wow, great Scott, there's holes everywhere. So every gray line is a hole. So you can see the entire meridian has holes along it. Every township has holes in it. This was pretty close to a worst case scenario. So my GIS analyst was telling me the students had done great work and they'd looked at the grid and everything was fine. 
And this told me that there were about 450,000 holes across Western Canada, which is really sad. Most of these were very, very small holes. So we're talking sub meter, sub half meter holes. But when you're trying to do a geospatial calculation and you're trying to say, okay, divide the oil production of this well between these two spaces, that had better add up to 100%. Because if I'm dealing with a million barrels of oil and I'm missing 1% of that, that's a fair amount of money, right? So it has to be absolutely perfect. So we had to reevaluate. We ended up splitting it into multi-steps. One of the problems when I talked about that densifier, FME just couldn't handle it. So we put in a sliver remover to take out those small holes and FME died again. There were just too many vertices, too much data. So we ripped apart the process and we split it into meridians. So we essentially divided that whole area into six. And you can see that here. Uh, so I'll talk about the coordinate rounder in just a second, but you can see that we did six different readers. So we now broke it up. It was a bit too bad because if we ever make a change to the grid, now we have to run this thing six times. Uh, we could add a workspace runner or that kind of stuff in there, but it's such a huge process as is, it still takes about a week to run this whole thing. Uh, so we run it fairly manually. We have someone that steps through and makes sure it's working as they go. Uh, one of the problems we ran into was coordinates. FME, so all of this is in NAT83, right? So NAT83 is decimal degrees which specifies that you have about six decimals of precision. FME doesn't follow that internally. So although FME knows the projection is decimal degrees, it doesn't hold your decimal places to six places. When it writes it out, it then rounds it up or down. Well, when I'm trying to get 100% accuracy, that kills me. So one of the places we found, so this is one of the ones where our our GIS analyst came back and said, well, no, it's, it's perfect until FME writes it out and then it dies. Turns out that when you used a feature inspector, you were getting nine decimal places, 10 decimal places because we were using a densifier, then a sliver remover and everything else. FME was bumping up the precision to be absolutely precise, but we could only have six decimal places because of the projection we were in. So we added a coordinate rounder. And with that, everything was beautiful. So that's what we wanted to see, and it actually comes down to about 100% accuracy. The, the meridian lines, those 200 meter gaps, we did use the students to fill those in, and that's part of why it's still a manual process. So we do make changes to this grid. We get clients who call in and go, well, the border of this lake is slightly off, so your angle that you're cutting off a section is a bit off, so we have to make a change to that, and we rerun this whole process. And it takes a week every time, because it's big and it's a bit slow. Uh, but ultimately, we did succeed using FME and we're really happy with the final product. So I talked about Western Canadian road allowances and some of the difficulties of removing them. Uh, really, I would use FME again for this. FME did prove to be the right tool. Uh, it very much is a repeatable process, even if it is a bit manual. Um, a lot of what we hear at the conference is all this live data, right? Like, oh, well, I can use this to tweet, or, oh, I get an email in and then server does something like this. That's not the world I live in. So I listen to the FME server stuff and I go, oh man, one day maybe I'll get to use something like that. But I wouldn't really want to call an FME server process, wait a week, and then get an email back that it worked, right? <laughs> That's, you know, I would be sad. Uh, but I would use FME and very much in the FME desktop world. That's where we live. Uh, testing the result using FME was, was Brilliant, if I do say so myself. Uh, I was really happy with that. That saved us a ton of time because visually you couldn't see these submeter, uh, these submeter problems. You zoom in that far in ArcMap, and all of a sudden it starts doing weird things. Uh, so FME really was probably the only way that we could have done that testing to that level of precision. Uh, and then we fixed the process, and we just kept working through it and working through it. So now we are ready for 2015, and very happy. And that's everything. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tim. Yep. Th this highlights something that came up yesterday that I kind of mentioned that a lot of what SAFE demonstrates are very simple things, you know, to get a concept across, a new feature. But what you do, what a lot of you guys do is with real data, much larger volume, bigger problems than we show. So it's, it's good for us to see this kind of thing, a true real world challenges. So that's quite interesting. And Thank in you. fact, the coordinate rounder came up in, that s in a National Resources Canada session as oh, well. Okay, well we had to do the same thing because we create too much precision um, 
in some of the transfers. Yeah, I didn't expect it at all. Yeah. Because FMA reads in the projection and writes in the projection, mm -hmm. it's very much aware of the projection. You can't just add meters randomly, that kind of stuff, right? So I didn't expect it to start <laughs> playing oh, with things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So any questions? Yeah. Can I give you the mic? Um, have you explored uh, what uh, the capacity of the computer, uh, how much it matters? Yeah, it, it, so we are running this on a, I think it's a 32 core server uh, with 128 gig of RAM. And FME maxes that at about 50 gig. So it'll read in and read in until, I mean, in Task Runner, that's how I monitor what FME is doing essentially. Once FME hits about 50 gig, it stops. Okay. Uh, increasing. So one of the things we were doing, one of the advantages of dividing it down to meridians was that's about 25 gig. So then we could actually run four workbenches at once. So we could process four meridians at once once we were more comfortable with it. And you would see memory usage go up to about 100 gig. Why? So I talked to Dale in Calgary about why FME maxed out at 50 gig and he just said, yeah, that's great. That was about <laughs> it. So, and really, honestly, it, it, FME uses more memory than any other program I use. So I'm pretty happy that it gets as big as it does. Yeah. Well, uh, how about the CPU? Um, CPU max? usage is surprisingly low. Um, even when the anchored snapper is running and stuff, the CPU usage isn't that high. So you'll see one core running at about 50%. Uh, it really doesn't seem to, so I tried getting some of that parallel stuff going because in 2013 they started, intro, I think it was 20, maybe it was before that. They've introduced the parallel stuff and I tried getting that going, but I think it must be waiting for all the features to come in before running the anchored snapper because it doesn't know what you're going to be snapping from and to. So I think because it waits for everything, then the parallel just doesn't help as much, right? But I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I tried. No, that's Didn't get totally going. true. Like we're gradually enhancing some of these transformers that are blocking transformers okay. to allow options such as, you know, if you could provide the anchors first and tell the transformer that, then it, right. then it would become a multi-process problem instead of a memory problem. Oh, okay. That's been done with um, some of the transformers. Feature, feature merger. Feature, feature merger, thank you. Yeah, that's Okay. Yeah, that's what feature merger you can provide suppliers first. Yeah, thanks. So that's an example of one that's been done, anchored snapper not. Yep. But for your case, you could just have used uh, an ordinary desktop machine with a lot of RAM. Essentially, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's running Windows. I'm pretty sure it's running Windows 7. It's, yeah, it's very straightforward. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, he doesn't like the mic, do you? <laughs> <laughs> With your uh, uh, your coordinate rounder, um, yep. what do you think that does with curves? Oh, I have absolutely no idea. Yeah. I don't deal with curves a whole yeah. lot. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't deal with arcs. Like, you're talking like a true arc, right? I don't know. It'd be interesting to try it. I mean, so much of what I deal with is it comes into a vertex, it goes out of the vertex, and that's it, right? So, yeah. Because yeah. if, you're, yeah, if you're changing a, you know, you know, rounding on a curve, that's supposed to maintain a certain radius, what happens, you know? It, yeah, well, it would change the, the whole, numbers, right? yeah, and all of a sudden your vertexes might not line up properly anymore and all kinds of stuff. Hmm, that's, yeah. That's a good question that I don't know the answer to either. We store cur uh, curves, well, it kind of varies, but as a point with a radius and so on, so that point is what would get rounded, but I don't think the radius would get rounded. I but could be wrong. Just the x and y comes out, I think, right? Is that what you said? Well, I don't, I'm not sure you'd be coordinate rounding and doing it then. So that's yeah. yeah. See, one of the things that I was really concerned with with using the coordinate rounder was that I would get two coordinates that would round up, and then I'd get an overlap. And I didn't. I tested for an overlap, and I didn't show that in the presentation. But I didn't get a single overlap anywhere, which was a bit surprising. So what exactly is going on? I'm guessing there's something going on somewhere. But it ends up being a perfect mathematical match. Yeah. So, Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks again. For